Guys, let me be honest with you. I don't want to make this video, but this is something that we need to talk about. So let's just rip off the bandit and roll the intro. Hey, Vlad here from DevInsideView.com. Welcome to another video. I've been making YouTube videos for over five years at this point, and I made almost 300 of them. And that doesn't include shorts or live stream. And with the exception of the best operating system for developers video, I've actually never made an A versus B video before. So why start now? Is it because I'm desperate for views or is it because everyone and their mother asked me this question, ranging from absolute beginners who want to know which stack they should learn to CTOs who want to know if they should rewrite all the things to the opposite stack. So let's try to answer this question right after the message from our sponsors, which is you. Thank you for supporting me on Patreon or technically thank you for supporting my video editor who with your help allows me to concentrate on answering your questions on Discord or during live streams. I'm glad that you're serious about improving the developer inside you. Good for you. All right, now I divided this video into two parts. This one is going to be for seasoned Scala developers, and the next one is going to be for newcomers to Scala. So if you're new to Scala, I see you in the next one. First and foremost, when I say cats, I mean cats effect. And when I say cats effect, I mean tagless finally. Just add all of those things wouldn't fit into the title of the video. So this video is rather about tagless funnel versus concrete effect types, in particular Zio. Secondly, I'm making this video as subjective as possible on purpose. Now do whatever you want with it. If you agree with it, hit the like button. If you disagree with it, hit the dislike button. If you're furious, smash the dislike button twice. Feel free to leave as many comments as you please. I will read all of them and I will try to answer all of them as well. Just please do me a favor and try to avoid comments like yeah, but Zio can't do X, or yeah, but Ketsafag can do this as well, and so on. We're trying to predict the future here, and the reason why I didn't want to make this video objective is because humans are not logical beings anyway. For instance, even though the feature parity is not at 100%, they are similar enough for me to avoid the need to compare them feature by feature or metric by metric. Also, I don't really care about which one is faster or who pioneered what, since this is not a kindergarten. Thirdly, I have made videos about all kinds of things. Cats, cats of fact, tagless final, and zeal, and I will continue doing so if I feel like it. However, I am going to pick a winner today, and I promise you, even though I am a senior developer, I'm not going to hide behind phrases like, it depends. In the past, I wanted to be as open-minded as possible. I figured that I'll just show you all the things, and then you will go and pick and choose on your own. But you guys seem to really want to be influenced, so here we are. Let's go. Scala is an extremely attractive language for people who are relentlessly curious about programming in depth. People who go out and create phenomenal libraries and tools to contribute back to the community. First and foremost, let me reassure you that whichever technology you pick in the Scala ecosystem, and this includes the non-functional stacks as well, you're going to be better off than most people out there. Very few communities can claim this about themselves. There is really only a handful out there. There is like Haskell, Elm, Rust, Closure. Maybe I have forgotten a couple, but really, this is it. What I'm trying to say is that if you already have a big code base written in Tagless Final, the gains that you're going to get from rewriting it to Zeal are not going to outweigh the costs. For instance, we have a 150,000 lines of half Monix, half Tagless Final Frankenstein at work. It's a rewrite that will incrementally take years to finish. Then we'll pick another effect type, probably Zeal. Uh, after this, we'll probably move on to Cats Effect 3. And after this, we're going to move to Scala 3. And only then, really, which will take years, will we reevaluate the situation and see if it makes sense to rewrite the whole thing to Zeal instead of just choosing it as an effect type. My point is that if you already have a stack that you like and it already works, changing the effect type should not have a high priority on your to-do list. And by the way, I'm going to refrain from using phrases like, in my humble opinion, because this entire video is my opinion, okay? And please, just because I have somewhat of a following, do not assign a disproportionate amount of weight to it. I'm just some guy who makes videos on the internet. I'm not smarter than any of you because of it, and my ability to predict the future is as good as yours. Now, as I already mentioned, this first video is for experienced Scala developers, so let me give it to you straight. Zero is winning. It's not hands down, but it's winning. And as I already mentioned, I did not bother to gather any stats. This entire video is my opinion based on a feeling. Over the years, I became more and more convinced that even though Techless Final is a viable option to build really large software, the benefits that it provides are A, neglectable, and it's a bit pricey. Please allow me to try to put my feelings into words. It's not about whether fact tracking is bulletproof or not. It's not that parametric reasoning is not beneficial. 
It's not that the top level ecosystem is bad people or bad software. None of it. Here's the thing. I personally find Tegla's Final an incredible way to learn functional programming, especially functional programming in the type language, and to be more specific, functional programming based on category theory. I just noticed that after you gain some experience in functional programming, Tegla's Final becomes somewhat unnecessary. I'm not saying it's not useful, it's just unnecessary. And also, let's be honest, it also kind of becomes tedious. As an experienced developer, ask yourself this. When was the last time that you accidentally called something like unsafe run sync and you were glad that the compiler caught it by telling you that this method doesn't exist? When was the last time that you wanted to call flat map and you were glad that the compiler saved you by telling you, no, 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 this F only has a functor. Are you sure that you want to add the extremely powerful flat map method to it? Be honest, most interpreters in practice use a monad throw. How much benefit do you actually gain from this? Here's my typical workflow example. Let's say I'm writing an interpreter. Very soon I'm going to need to call map on it, right? And the compiler tells me that map doesn't exist. And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to add the functor context bound. I'm trying to add it. The compiler tells me that it doesn't know where functor is, so I need to do an import. And my IDE helps with it. With it. Great, right? So it imports cats.functor or cats.underscore, depending on conf your configuration, right? But my map call still doesn't compile, right? Because I need to know that, hey, I also need to import, you know, cat syntax all or something similar. And this time, by the way, the IDE doesn't help me, which is not an issue because, again, this entire video is for experienced developers. I am an experienced developer. I know that I need to import this. But still, why am I doing all of this? If I am an experienced developer, why do I need those training wheels? So to sum it up, this is how I genuinely feel about Tagless Final. I feel as if it was the training wheels on my bike. But I don't need to be slapped on my fingers every time I forget some magical incantation to bring some implicit in scope to make my code compile. Now you could say, okay Vlad, you're an experienced developer, good for you, but I'm part of a team where people have different skill levels, so it would be great if the compiler had their back. And I agree, yes, it would be great, and we should use all tools at our disposal to detect defects as soon as possible. In fact, it's my personal mission to disassociate the word bug with the software industry. I am very disgusted by the current state of affairs. However, I also want to ship code. There needs to be a balance. Let me give you an example. It has nothing to do with Tagless Final, and it's very, very simple. Let's say you have a list of people, a person being a simple case class, you know, name and age, and you want to call the wonderful method called partition on that list, and you partition by, say, you know, age greater or equal 18, right? And so you end up with a tuple with two lists, in one you have the adults, in another one you have the minors. The problem with this code, though, is that everything that happens after the call to partition is not type safe. The compiler has no idea that these two lists are somehow semantically different. He has no idea that some filtering took place. It is very easy to give the wrong list to the next subroutine, and then all of a sudden you end up with miners going to nightclubs or drinking alcohol. Now, strangely enough, this is also trivial to avoid. You just create two different case classes, you wrap those lists in them, and there you go. We're in a nominal type system after all, so even though their structure is the same, to the type system, they will be different simply because they have a different name. And by the way, I don't care about performance or boxing. This is not what this is about. The point I'm trying to make is how many of you actually genuinely write code like this? Like, hand on your heart. We're not typing everything to the max. We're not unit testing everything to the max. We're not exploiting CI CD to the max. We're not even following the best practices to the max. And why? Because there needs to be a balance. Of course, we don't want our code to break because of every little thing, but we also want to ship something. And so we have to use our common sense. Tagless Final is just not pulling its weight. And so, if you have to lay off a couple of best practices, I'm sorry, but Tagless Final is going to be one of the first to go. And if something does sneak in, which I genuinely have never seen before, then you have other knobs that you can crank up. For example, you could improve your PR culture or your testing culture or well, as already mentioned, there are other knobs that you could crank up. Now, let's move on to the next point, and this one actually tries to defend Tagless Final a little. The Scala community is tiny, and most of our libraries and tools are maintained by very small groups of people. In fact, many of them are one-man shows. And I have to give credit where it's due. These are phenomenal pieces of software, but the bus factor is very scary. I'm talking about this because one of the major selling points for Tagless Final is the fact that it protects us from our beloved effect type library not being maintained anymore. We literally have this at work right now. The main Monix maintainer had some personal issues going on in his life, so he couldn't dedicate his time to maintain Monix for a bit. And Scala, being a fast-moving target, came up with Cat's Effect 3, and we can't move to it yet because 
we haven't finished the rewrite to tackle this final. Now, first of all, we're going to be fine. Thank you for your concern. And secondly, eventually he came back and there will be soon a release that is compatible with Catsfec 3. But you get the idea. It's a valid point. On one hand, I understand this defensive concern, but on the other hand, and this is the part where I'm going to consult my crystal ball, guys, I believe this is it. Like, Zeo seems to be different. The buzz factor is higher, beginner-friendly, first-time contributor-friendly, online presence, conferences, books. The companies are happy to adopt it. The developers are happy about it. The library ecosystem is growing. The list just goes on and on. They even have a library called Prelude, which is an approach similar to Tegla's Final. And also they have Cats Interop. Now, I'm not saying that the type level ecosystem doesn't have those things. I'm just saying that it doesn't seem like Zio is going to disappear tomorrow. In conclusion, if I were to start a new project today, it would be written in Zio. And trust me, I have not made this decision lightly. I was on the fence for years, but when I'm starting a new project, I have to choose anyway. And just using it as an effect type is not the same. Just FYI, we're going to start building new projects here on YouTube live, so don't forget to subscribe, click the bell, and whatnot. And also, they're all going to be in Scala 3. Just saying. Oh, and one last thing. I've heard this argument many times before on Reddit that allegedly the Scala community prefers libraries to frameworks so that we can pick and choose what we need. Now, it all sounds fine and dandy, but I just have one question. Who told you that? Was there some vote that I missed? I've been in the Scala community since 2010, and I don't remember a meeting under a bridge. I believe that this narrative exists simply because we didn't have any good frameworks before. Our only alternatives so far were a couple of web frameworks like Lift and Play, and also the Akka middleware, which is not well suited for building user-facing applications anyway. Akka is a tool to build other tools. Lift never took off, and Play is just another Rails that didn't take off because the community leaned towards pure FP. Well, now it seems like we do have an alternative. Zio 2 just came out and it seems like it has even more batteries included than before. Tracing, metrics, auto-blocking, even logging. Seriously, who wants to spend their time evaluating JSON or logging library? It feels like such a relief to have all of those low-level things built in. They're just means to an end. I want to ship code. I don't care which logging library I'm using. Does it work? Cool. Good enough. In fact, I wish that choosing a login library was the only problem that I had building software. I hope that this didn't end up sounding like a rant, but hey, you wanted answers and you got them. Oh, and yes, Zio is not as mature as a top level ecosystem, but there are many companies who use it in production and they're just fine. I'm an idealist, and even though I do believe that some competition is necessary, the Scala ecosystem is so tiny that we simply cannot afford fighting each other and waste resources on building completely separate micro ecosystems within it. It's not necessarily a bad thing that most Java shops are spring shops. And I know that some of you don't want Zio to become the next spring, but I do believe that it is for a greater good. I'm tired of people coming to the Scala Reddit and asking which stack they should learn. We're tiny. We don't need 20 logging libraries, 20 JSON libraries, five web frameworks, three HTTP libraries. The numbers are arbitrary, but you get the point. There are three major pinpoints in Scala, implicits, tooling, and too many ways to do the same goddamn thing. I usually don't swear in my videos, but I felt like it was appropriate this time. And I genuinely believe that Zio is solving at least one of them, and I would like to stress the phrase at least. I won't drop this mic because it was expensive and also it's attached to a mic arm, but you get the idea. All right, if you're a beginner, I see you in the next one in which I will explain what you just want. For now, as always, it's been Vlad from devintidy.com. Don't forget to like this video if you did, subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you, and if you wish to support tech education, please consider doing so on GitHub sponsors or Patreon. I love you all, so please don't destroy the comment section. It took a lot of intern hours to build. Peace.